and good evening, everybody. My name is James Irwin. I'm the Director of Educational Programs for Sigma Alpha Epsilon, and I want to welcome you to uh, the Recruitment 365, What Does This Actually Mean webinar that we're hosting this evening. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming out for this. Uh, we've selected some outstanding presenters and members of our recruitment committee uh, who pulled this together to teach you guys about recruitment. Uh, presenting this evening, we're going to have uh, Mike Corelli. He's the Province Omicron Archon and the National Recruitment Committee Chair. Michael Hood, a Recruitment Committee member. Russell Beth, the Regional Director for the Kerr Region. And Tom Healy from uh, Campus Speak and who also does Recruitment Boot Camp. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Uh, please be aware that in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a chat feature, which some of you start to discover. At a certain point, you'll be asked to you know, do some chatting in there. And also, there's a Q&A box above that. Feel free at any time if you've got a question, post it out there. If I can answer it while uh, the presentation is going on, I will. If not, then we'll hold it to the end uh, for the uh, Q&A session at the end. So uh, without further ado, uh, Brother Pirelli, take it away. Thanks, James. Brothers, I hope you all are having a, a great evening and uh, a good semester. Um, you know, I'm really excited about presenting this, this topic tonight to everybody that's out there. Um, we've got a great opportunity for us to, to really look at recruitment from a holistic perspective and looking at it from you know an all-year perspective and why we're really doubling this as a 365 uh, strategy, recruitment strategy. Um, as we kind of get rolling here tonight, some of the intended outcomes that we have plan planned out for you all is uh, we want you guys to have a better understanding of recruitment um, and that recruitment is an ongoing process. It's not just a, a very simple you know one-week, two-week process. It's an ongoing process throughout the entire year. And obviously realizing that a lot of the fall recruitments have been completed uh, we really want to give you guys an opportunity tonight to really begin to start focusing on recruitment from this point forth as we begin to look uh, at the spring semester and begin to put some strategies in place that we feel um, will help you all as chapter members and to begin to implement as part of your ongoing process and, and philosophy as far as recruitment goes. Um, as we keep in mind, I want everybody to think about recruitment as the lifeblood of this fraternity. Obviously, as we begin to talk about recruitment and we talk about different things, we want to educate you on how we can go about this all-year-long philosophy. Um, and begin to start putting some, some understandings in place about what is this product that we're actually selling. We typically think of SAE as our beloved fraternity and our organization, but we also got to remember that it is a product that we're asking people to, to go into business with. And so as we begin to look at this uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, we want us to really begin to differentiate what is it that this product that we belong to and that we're trying to sell, and how is this product different than the other organizations that are on campus. And more importantly, we really want to have an opportunity for all of us that are on the call here tonight, whether it be presenters or you that are out in the realm, to begin to share some resources to assist you in recruiting, uh, recruiting SAEs, not turning them into SAEs. And that's going to be some of the themes that you'll see throughout our presentation here tonight. As James mentioned, we obviously want to leave it open for question and answers throughout the process here. So as you guys look at the webinar um, uh, screen right there in the middle, go ahead and type in questions at any time um, throughout the process. Uh, tonight around the presentation that you may have for any of us as presenters, and we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, also, there will be a portion of the presentation where we'll ask for you guys to kind of put some feedback um, about one of the slides that's on there, and we ask that you go ahead and type that into the chat portion of the bottom. So as we kind of get rolling here, one of the things that we really want to uh, conceptualize here is a lot of times we use the language of rush. And when we think about rush, we think about this concept of a one to two week process that we see our chapter members and our brothers scrambling around to put a lot of things into place, getting posters up, getting flyers out, maybe hosting some informational meetings. And you see the chapter usually putting a lot of concepts into a one or two week process. And a lot of times we really want to pre uh, present to everybody is the concept that rush and the mentality of rush has died. Uh, rush is dead in, in the most part. And in the heyday where we had brothers coming in and flooding our gates and stuff like that, we have seen some of those numbers drop off, but our, our numbers are beginning to increase again. So we've got to begin to start thinking about how are we actually approaching our philosophy of recruitment. And so to begin to kind of conceptualize, when we talk about recruitment, we want to really begin to put a plan in place. We want to begin to think about um, how are we going about this recruitment process? What is our plan that needs to be in place to actually recruit the quality of men that we're out there seeking? Uh, we can't recruit who we don't know. And as we begin to start really thought, talking about this process and putting some concepts into recruitment, we want to begin to start putting the concept of building a relationship with the gentlemen that we're out there asking them um, to be part of our brotherhood. So we've got to begin um, to think about not just getting people to join that come to our, our, our tables or, or come to our, our specific meetings, but get a chance to know these individuals throughout a process. We can't just focus on a few days to really get to know a potential member. That is really the concept of recruiting, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we kind of go on through the process. 
Um, again, one of the other big elements that we've really highlighted is a lot of times we spend a lot of our resources um, in putting them into just freshmen. We've got to begin to start thinking about that the old heyday of just getting freshmen to join is no longer of today's recruitment strategies. A lot of our campuses across the realm are in a deferred recruitment process um, and have kind of opened up the opportunity for us to really look at all different other strategies for us to begin to look at. So we've got to begin to start talking about this larger market of individuals that are on our college campuses that are out there, not just looking at the you know, several thousand students that are coming in, but the other uh, you know, multiple thousands of brothers that are out there. So as we begin to kind of conceptualize and really set the tone for the rest of this presentation tonight and listen to what the brothers on the call have to hear, we want to put in the mind frame of building a relationship with our, with our potential recruits and understanding that there is a large market that is out there for us to begin to start uh, tackling. One of the concepts that we like to talk about when we're with the recruitment committee and even with some of our uh, recruitment strategies is looking at this concept of the hunters versus the gatherers. When we typically think about the hunters, we typically, uh, these individuals are individuals that are out there um, and they're seeking uh, what we actually want and in, in theory, seeking out what we actually need in our fraternity. One of the things that I, I find as, uh, as part of our, our hunter philosophy is when we're out there, we are recruiting SAEs. We should know who they are. We should find them because we've done some really good strategies of really identifying and looking for them. So as we begin to start looking and conceptualizing what is a hunter, we start really thinking about you know, seeking out the individuals that we want to be part of our fraternity, getting to know them and understanding who they are, versus our gatherers. And when we're talking about a gatherer, typically we look at the gatherer as somebody who picks up what is available. Um, and some of our, our language and stuff we've used, you know, some people that are out there picking up the scraps or the people that are just kind of coming out. When we're looking at the hunter versus the gatherers, we really need to go after what we want rather than take the, the best of what we see available. And that's really where the ultimate strategy of recruitment really come into place here. So we've got to conceptualize how we as an organization are classifying ourselves. Are we going to be the hunters or are we going to be like every other fraternity and chapter that's out there that is just taking what's available at the, at the present moment? And that's really where this 365 degree strategy actually comes into place. We are the hunters out there spending every single opportunity that we have, whether it be in our classrooms, whether it be in the other clubs and organizations that we have, or even our roommates that may currently not be fraternities. We're actually taking the time to really get to know who we, who we want and almost revisiting the philosophy that our founders had when they were recruiting our first you know, new member class of coming in. If we are going out there and finding the men that are SAEs and believe in the strategies and in philosophy of who we are. One of the things that we really want us to understand is, as I, as I mentioned earlier in one of the outcomes, we want to begin to start thinking about SAE as this product. A lot of times when we're out there and we're looking at this grand fraternity that we all belong to, we, we, we typically forget how are we actually defining Sigma Alpha Epsilon. This is, you know, this is an opportunity for us to really begin to strategize how are we defining our organization? How are we beginning to look at who it is that we are and what is it that we're actually selling? So what I want to have everybody do, if you could, just take a few minutes and um, in the chat section, I want you to, to begin to say, tell me some ideas or some things that you as brothers that are out there uh, use to define what Sigma Alpha Epsilon is. And as you guys are thinking about that, I want you to kind of conceptualize what is it that you are, are, are thinking, what are some of the ideas, the selling points that are out there. And if you could, go ahead and just kind of start typing some of those things in the chat section. This is an opportunity for us as uh, the members that are on the call here to really see what is it that you guys in the realm believe um, SAE to be and, and help us to begin to start defining some of these different opportunities and things that are of our fraternity. As you guys are going ahead and, and, and defining this, one of the things I really want to highlight on this is obviously one of the big concepts of our fraternity is you know, I want everybody to think about you have roughly about 10 to 15 to 20 seconds to make that first good impression. Or think about the opportunity when you're sitting in an elevator and you're going up five or six flights and stuff like that. How are you defining Sigma Alpha Epsilon? When an individual says, well, what is SAE? Tell me about the organization. Tell me who you guys are. What is it that, that we are actually selling as our organization? What is it that we feel Sigma Alpha Epsilon truly is? Um, you and I and brothers that are already part of the organization, we know what SAE is. We've been able to experience it through our interactions, uh, experience it through our events, our activities, through the brotherhood that we have. But when we have members that are coming into the organization, they do not know what that experience is. So as we begin to kind of think about that, we want to understand that, you know, given the definition uh, of our organization will help to us to really put a big picture of things. 
um, in place and be able to allow for us to have a better understanding as to what it is that we are and how do we sell our product. the wire here and I appreciate some of the individuals obviously we've talked a little bit about the true gentleman we talked about our brotherhood and the concepts that are there uh, maximizing our, our life's experiences a lot of these definitions that you guys are putting up there and we'll come back to some of these here shortly these definitions really give us the power and the opportunity to really stand above all of our other fraternities that are out there it gives us the opportunity to understand exactly who is that we are and, and really what is it that we're really trying to sell um, but it also gives us an opportunity to find where we make those connections with the potential members that we're trying to recruit. And it allows for us to really have a better understanding of, of, of knowing who the men that we want to belong to our organization. So I want to appreciate some of the feedback. Feel free to add some more comments in there if you guys uh, would like to, um, you know, share about how, and how you guys begin to um, define SA a little bit more. But I want you to really think about that and begin to encourage your brothers when we go into recruitment to begin to define Sigma Alpha Epsilon. What is it that is our strengths? What are some of our weaknesses? What are some of the areas of membership that we need to grow on and asking ourselves all of these questions will allow for us to really maximize our, our recruitment philosophy and begin to put some new strategies into place to creating a, a very sustainable uh, organization. As we begin to, to kind of move on here, we, we really kind of start saying all the things that you guys have talked about, the true gentleman, some of our leadership opportunities, the leadership school, perhaps maybe focusing on some of our service opportunities with, with you know, being the true gentleman day of service. Um, these are all of these, some of the components that, to name a few, that really help to make Sigma Alpha Epsilon different than any other organization. A lot of times we talk about brotherhood, but when we're talking with our other chapters and our other organizations, brotherhood is a, is a word that gets used a lot by our other chapters. What about the Sigma Alpha Epsilon Brotherhood makes us different? What about being true gentlemen makes us different? What about being leaders and scholars makes us different than other, any other organization? When we start putting a lot of these concepts together, we really start focusing on a lot of the values that our, our fraternity is rooted in. And so Sigma Alpha Epsilon is a, is, should be a fraternity, and we should really remind our men that we are an organization that is values-based and also values-driven, not just uh, alluding to us having a, a set of core values, but obviously implementing those values and finding men that really adhere to our mission and our purpose and understanding what actually that is all about. You know, again, as I revisited... Um, revisit this concept of putting yourselves into an elevator. You roughly have five or six floors that you're going to be traveling with somebody, and if they said, well, tell me what makes Sigma Alpha Epsilon different, we should be able to have a scripted opportunity and a believable opportunity for us to be able to sell those points to those individuals that are in that elevator with us and be able to tell how our product is valued, how our product is valuable to them, and how our product is valuable to the communities that we are associated with. But more importantly, how this product is going to better them as men in our society and men in, in the community. Having all of this will allow for us to really have a better understanding as to what Sigma Alpha Epsilon is and begin to, to begin to recruit those people that align up with those particular values that we're identifying ourselves with. So as we begin to kind of look at, at really what makes Sigma Alpha Epsilon different and understanding really what, what brings us all together, we've got to put ourselves into a, a, a somewhat of a different mind frame what we have known recruitment to be and the philosophies that we have known recruitment to be may not be exactly what our potential new recruits are, um, are looking at you. So it's really important for us to begin to really philosophically approach uh, the concept of thinking almost like a new recruit. As we begin to do that, we want to share some ideas and some concepts with you guys to really begin to put us into that mind frame. Good evening, gentlemen. I uh, thank you for taking time out of your evening to go ahead and uh, join us tonight. And I'd also like to congratulate you guys on taking the first step into uh, making your chapter better in the area of recruitment and to making our brotherhood better. Thinking like a new recruit is oftentimes one of the most overlooked aspects of the recruitment process. You really actually have to get yourself into the mindset and the shoes of thinking like a new recruit, and this will actually be your first step into becoming a better recruiter. For many of you that understand business, understanding what a new recruit is looking for is understanding your market and understanding your market is key to capturing that market, so that's a really good philosophy to think about. A lot of times the market is usually these guys that are fresh out of high school, they're freshmen, they haven't been away at home, they haven't been away from home for a long time, or if ever, so they're actually gonna be coming out to recruitment very, very uneasy, they're not gonna have a sense of knowing or knowledge, so that's gonna make any person naturally just uncomfortable, so it's just, it's vital to actually to begin to understand what these new recruits are looking for. You really want to assume 
that these new recruits know absolutely nothing about Greek life other than what they've seen in the media, they've seen in television shows, movies, heard from people. That's all they're going to really know. So it's really important that we stay away from using Greek alphabet phrases, terms that they just may not know or understand. And if you're going to use them, definitely always be in the back of your mind of trying to figure out a different way to say it so they'll be included in the conversation or just go ahead and explain it just so they know without having to ask them if they understand. Uh, you really just want to make them feel at home because the more comfortable we make them feel, the better experience they're going to have and the more likely they're going to join our organization. Thinking like a new recruit doesn't just apply to freshmen because that's kind of the concept. People often associate new recruit with freshmen. We have sophomores, juniors, and seniors that are coming out to our recruitment events all the time. So we actually have to think like a new recruit in their shoes. We have to think, what do they know about my organization at my chapter or at my college already? They already had these preseason notions because they've seen you on campus. They've heard about your events. They've, they've been told stuff by people that have been their friends since they've been in college. So we really need to start understanding what these, these upperclassmen coming out to recruitment are thinking so we can go ahead and begin to just knock down these preceded notions so we can, we can go ahead and overcome them and just really get not only the freshmen on board, but all, kinds, uh, all our, all our um, potential members on board. Uh, the next thing we're going to really focus on is assuming that a new recruit knows nothing. One of the biggest mistakes you can assume is that he already knows going in. And once again, that's just going to make him feel uncomfortable. It's going to make him just feel very awkward if he's in a conversation. And as many of you know, if you're part of a conversation you don't know anything about, you tend to just feel very awkward and just kind of slowly drift away. And we don't want that. We want them to feel included. As I kind of mentioned, he only really has preceded notions from the media, TV, and shows. And most of the times, as many as we know, these preceded notions are just the negative stereotypes that are portrayed of Greeks, and that's not what we're about. You really want to make him feel educated. You never want him to feel left out of the conversation, and you kind of really just want to stay away from the Greek talk. You just really want to focus on universal topics that everybody can easily join in, come in and out of the conversation. Um, Selling the Greek community first is probably the most important thing when trying to recruit someone. You really have to understand that you can't sell them on joining SEE before they understand the community. An, an, uh, an example I would use is if someone doesn't like wearing jeans, we can't sell, we can't sell them on buying our brand of like say Levi without having them want to accept the idea first and be part of it. So we really want to go ahead and sell them on joining the Greek community first. You really just want to get them educated and caught up to date with what we're doing what we're about, and then he's going to go ahead and think, this is something I want to join. Now he's going to start you know, looking at the, the specifics about what he's really looking for. So this is where we can really start to recruit them. But it's vital to sell them on the Greek community first, because if you try to sell them on SEE before the Greek community, we're just going to go ahead and scare them off all, all together. Uh, understanding your market is also, is, I mean, is as important. We kind of, thinking like a new recruit is going to really get you understanding your market but you also have to know the logistics of your market. As you guys can see in front of you, about 10 to 20 percent of our potential member pool are the always joiners. They're the guys that are coming to college. They've already decided they're going to join an organization. We really don't have to recruit them. They're already going to go Greek. So what we need to do is keep them part of our recruiting process, but they can't be the majority. And the mistakes a lot of chapters do is they go ahead and focus just on the always joiners. This is our example of gathering. They're, going have, they're gathering the guys that are already there instead of hunting the guys they, they want and that the, the guys that are going to be the best. We really need to begin switching our focus from the always joiners to the maybe joiners. The maybe joiners are about 60 to 80 percent of your population. These are the guys that have at least thought about going Greek, but they're kind of on the fence for whatever reason. They have various reasons, those kind of things. But the best part about the maybe joiners is they have already con at least considered joining Greek life, which means that's our opening, that's our foothold to go ahead and start recruiting them. We don't have to sell them on the Greek community, we have to sell them on our own organization. But we also have to make sure they feel comfortable enough coming in. The never joiners are about 10 to 20 percent. They're your independents, they're your guys that openly just oppose Greek life, they say they're never going to grow Greek life. To me this is important because my experience with the fraternity is you'll go across the country and I'm sure there's guys in each of your chapter that if you ask them did they ever think they would be going Greek, they'll raise their hand and say no. Personally, I never plan to join a fraternity, and I'm, I'm still here as an alumni doing all this stuff. So those guys are just as important as the other groups. 
don't write them off just because they say they're never going to go Greek. Because if we write them off, we're just going to reinforce the stereotypes that we're already given. So it's just it's important to keep them as part of the thing. Who are the maybe joiners? You really have to understand your market, so you really have to think like a new recruit and a maybe joiner. You want to think about what their stereotypes are. You guys want to think about what do these potential members want. It's not what we want. It's what they're looking for. It's what they want. You can't sell a product if the, if the person doesn't want to buy the product. And you also have to think about what they don't want. This is, this is really thinking like a new recruit, so that's really important. The maybe joiners need to be firmly sold on the concept of going green. Then they need to be sold on us. That's really important. Uh, most, the, mo the maybe joiners are going to be our most important group, obviously, because they're the largest part of our pool out there. They make over 50%, if not sometimes four-fifths of whatever we're looking for. So they're the guys we really need to focus on. And a lot of times we do make the mistake of focusing on the always joiners. One of the things to kind of remember here, gentlemen, as we're looking at these maybe joiners, obviously as you're seeing out there, that is one of the largest markets that, uh, that's out there. And if you typically look at most college campuses and you look at uh, most of the recruits that come in, a lot of times you'll see that there are these maybe joiners that are out there. These are the individuals that you said, well, you know, I thought about joining the fraternity, but I really wasn't sure, so they're kind of in that thing. These maybe joiners are those we need to recruit. These are the, these are the guys that we don't necessarily need to rush. When we're looking at these maybe joiners, we need to take the necessary time as we're talking about SAE as a product and really spending the time throughout the entire year getting to know these individuals. This is where we really put in this recruitment philosophy, we're really taking the time to get to know them. As you're going to hear, as I mentioned before, the, the, the recruitment phase is really about building relationships up and really taking those concepts of the maybe joiners and building those relationships up with them, taking the necessary and much needed time to get to know these individuals so you're not necessarily using your pledge process as a way of weeding people out. You've already taken the time to really get to know these people ahead of time. So you already know if they make the quality of SAE that you require and that you deserve in your organization. Often these maybe joiners, um, our, our potential members, become our best brothers in the organization. Sometimes we think that those that have already decided that they are going to join the fraternity, they're gung-ho, they come in and they tell us that SAE is the only fraternity for them, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes we sometimes see them as becoming our brothers that maybe aren't the most active and productive. But when we spend the time to know those, those, um, those maybe joiners, these are the brothers that typically go on to do a lot of good things in the organization because they've, they've, they've learned more about it, they're there for the right reasons, and they truly value the understanding of what Sigma Alpha Epsilon, our mission and our purpose, and going back to those values-based and those values-driven philosophies um, are embedded in those individuals. So it's really important for us to really begin to look at that, that middle third of the, of the population and spend a lot of our time and resources into getting those because that is where the larger population is. And if you guys are obviously looking at SAE as a, as a business or as a market, typically you'd want to go where you know you can flourish in the market. And so taking that concept is really important for us to really make sure that we're going to invest a lot of our resources in lifelong brothers, not just you know temporary brothers. And that's really where we talk about recruitment as the lifeblood of the fraternity. Okay. We're going to kind of talk about a little bit why these members do join our organization. As you guys can kind of see in front of you, one of the most important reasons they join is, is our mission. They truly believe in our mission. They believe in the true gentleman. That's our number one recruiting tool, the true gentleman. They they, if they believe in it, a good idea is to go ahead and bid them because if they're going to believe in our mission, they're going to believe in everything else that is associated with us. They're going to want to do everything else that makes us not only a better chapter, but a better fraternity across the realm. Example, another reason they go ahead and believe us is that the services we offer. A lot of times guys often forget to talk about the types of services we offer. We offer housing options. We offer scholarships. We offer just the experience that some organizations can't give to their members, for instance, like clubs and sports really can't offer the things we offer to these guys. So that's another reason they really do wish to join us. And probably one of the biggest reasons people join us is the professional reason. They have that opportunity. They see the networking. They see the alumni connections. They see the opportunities for, pers for professional growth, of, you know, being a brother, developing the resume, really getting that experience, going to leadership school, going to regional conferences, that kind of thing. We can offer so much more that a lot of our organizations can never offer them and will never be able to offer them. So that's, that's a need we're being able to fill with them. So we're really trying to, we're really able to reach out there and really connect with them on that level. And obviously, one of the most prominent reasons why guys first join us is social, the social interaction. I mean, obviously, we know we have that covered. 
our chapters offer the formals, the tailgates, the brotherhood events, the alumni events. That's one of the biggest reasons people join is they want to find that group of friends. They want to meet other people. And joining a fraternity, joining SE is obviously why they do. We, we have those connections with the sororities, the other organizations. They get to meet our alumni. They get to meet people they never would have had an opportunity to meet. So we're just really feeling that social interaction, which is probably the biggest reason they do join. Obviously, as, as we've kind of uh, alluded to, and we started talking about some of these concepts, and really looking at, you know, why are these individuals joining, and asking ourselves the questions of, you know, why are they doing this? Why are they joining our organization? And answering the questions. And typically, we look at, you know, sometimes we'll say a lot of people find that connection and whatnot. Some of the things that we have on the screen here for you is, is you know, what do we often sell these potential members? What are we selling when they come into our our smokers or our recruitment events or at our information tables? And a lot of things that we talk about is. We often say we're the best fraternity that's on this campus. Well, I guarantee Lambda Chi, Sigma Chi, and all the other fraternities are saying they are the best brotherhood on this campus. So we've got to remember that that is not a differentiating point for us. We typically say that we are the best brotherhood, but often, too often, we forget that we really don't know what a true brotherhood is until we actually go through the experiences of, of brotherhood, understanding what a brother actually is, understanding what the fraternity is, and what it means to be part of this brotherhood. So we can sell that to them, but again, as, as we alluded to earlier in the slide, you know, we've got to expect that these members know nothing about our organization. And so when we're often looking at selling the SAE product, we often sell them on that best brotherhood. As we've talked about the networking and the alumni, the awesome social events, the functions that we're having, the athletics, the intramurals, the, the, you know, those, the, that, that athletic side of our fraternity, all of the traditions, whether it be you know, the traditions of you know, your, hist your history of your chapter or some of the lo local history cha uh, traditions, whether it be in your chapter or the Greek community or belonging to something. You know, and, and sometimes we of often sell our chapter size and our reputation as one of our main selling points. But all too often we forget that actually when we take the time to, to, to talk to the brothers or after they've gone through, through this process, you know, we actually see that these are the things that really sell them. We actually see that, you know, the shared interests, the common purposes, the common values that they have, those relationships that they build, the personal stories or the experiences that they've been able to share throughout their experience, whether it be in their, their pledge class or their, their active membership or even our alumni brothers, um, the camaraderie between uh, the brothers and the stuff that's been shared. Uh, as we talked about also as part of some things we saw, but also um, what they've seen as our traditions, the, the Patty Murphys, the alumni reunions, the, you know, the social functions, the things like that, those are all part of our traditions. And obviously what sells them is the opportunities for growth both personally and professionally, whether it be opportunities for them to take on leadership roles, to meet alumni that they, you know, that, that could provide them opportunities for internships or future jobs. Those are the things that we actually find that really have sold them. And a lot of times those selling points are things that we actually learn over the course of our experiences and going through that. And it's really important for us to really look at both a combination of what we're selling them on and what they actually um, you know, buy that's part of that product to actually understand exactly what is it that we're really looking, um, looking for. Um, as we continue to kind of evolve that, it's really important to have a balance between the two, and it's really important for us to understand what is it that works specifically for our chapter. You know, perhaps obviously we have a lot of positive traditions at our local, our local community and stuff like that that, that equates to, you know, getting, getting these members, that they join for a particular reason, the history of the chapters. But also looking at the, the national level, seeing all that Sigma Alpha Epsilon on a national level has to sell these individuals, whether it be leadership school or your regional province leadership schools. Um, it could be maybe our Ritual Institute, really returning to some of these core values and understandings of who we are and what we were built upon. These are some of the things that, that the brothers might also be looking for. Perhaps maybe it could be some of the traditions of maybe having outstanding academics. You know, whatever these products, these, these things that you're trying to sell that you're looking for in, in your organization, this is what the members are also looking for. And so it's really important for us to kind of really begin to, to function and focus in on those elements of, of, of our product and how we're going about selling those aspects. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Russell Best, current region director, uh, Cincinnati and Ohio Epsilon graduate. Um, so why don't men join, right? I think we can come up with our own list uh, of uh, objections. You know, Mike talked about what are the reasons that, that men actually join, what do we sell them on, but what are the reasons that sometimes men just decide that they're not going to join a fraternity? Uh, I guess I would add that... The, Sometimes we just flat out don't ask men if they're interested. And rather than beating around the bush, 
if, if we just had an honest conversation with potential members about, hey, what would you say if we offered you an inventory, uh, excuse me, an invitation to join our fraternity? Uh, we might one find out that they really want to join, or two that they have some concerns. So these concerns, like I don't want to be hazed, my grades will suffer. Uh, there's just a focus on, on alcohol and parties. I don't have the time. It costs too much money. Mom, girlfriend, dad, whatever a significant other doesn't want me to join. You could add in. The, the broad objection that, you know, I'm just not the frat type. Uh, and also things, if you do or don't have a house, if you don't have a house and there's a concern, well, if you guys don't have a house, how might that affect your membership? If you do have a house, uh, potential men might be concerned, well, what I have to live in and how much does that cost? You guys have all heard these before, right? somewhat rhetorical question there, but I suppose that we, we need to be prepared here to answer these questions, to, to deal with these objections. And it's not just so that we're prepared for these objections necessarily, but these are really the types of questions that we should be asking potential members, right? This is the hunting side of it. We're not just gathering. We're not just gathering the best that we can find out there. We are really intentionally seeking specific members because we know that they'll be a good fit for our chapter. So making sure that, that we have these, you can call these pre-closed discussions, quality like responses. Fired Up Recruitment Experts has a great guide for this. I, I know that Tom uh, and, and Dave Smallman with Recruitment Boot Camp, they've got some great resources too but just being prepared in Recruitment 365 to answer questions. The potentials have questions like, well, seriously, how much time will this uh, take up? What will the cost be? Uh, can I live in the house within my first year? Um, I'm concerned about being hazy. You know, every one of your members should have a good answer for these questions. And if not, then they should be able to direct uh, potentials to, to your members who do have good answers. And you want to make sure that you have these discussions with them, that you breach these discussions before you bid them. Right? This starts to, this, this is part of that whole discussion, not just about recruitment, but down the road about retention and are these going to be good contributing brothers, especially those maybe joiners who might be on the fence. You want to have these conversations with them and really make sure that they're not just throwing out excuses like, I don't have the time for this. Well, then come back with them. Well, how, how much time do you really think this will take? And have a real discussion with them about what their objections might be. Uh, it, it gives you great insight into what their concerns might be. It also tends to increase bid acceptance rate. Because going into your bidding sessions, before you even bid a man, you've already had some discussion with them about his likelihood of actually joining, what his concerns might be. For instance, like if he's concerned about grades and you talk with him, then you might find out that he's struggling with academics. But then you can have that conversation before the bid, uh, and it just helps you close the deal. And we provided a, a hyperlink there uh, for that response guide if you'd like uh, to reference that. And gentlemen, as, as uh, Russell was just saying, um, we post, uh, post presentation, we're actually going to send you an email with some of these links for you guys to have as resources. Um, this particular resource is a really great way to address some of those questions as Russell was talking about of, of, of answering reasons why people don't join. And a lot of times it allows for us to have a pretty much a great handle on our potential uh, you know, pitfalls that may come through recruitment and how do we address those as a brotherhood. And so it's really important for us to kind of look at that concept and begin to streamline some of our structures in order to kind of close the deal and be able to, to be well prepared and well versed um, in order to handle any and all circumstances that may come up from any of our potential recruits. So as we begin to kind of focus in on that, um, some of the key things to remember here as we really highlight, and some of this may not be rocket science to y'all, but again, recruitment is sales. We've talked quite a bit about that. We're out there selling our, our product. We're out there selling Sigma Alpha Epsilon. You know, looking at the macro things, rush uh, and recruitment is sales, no matter when and how you're doing it, whether it be for two weeks or whether it be for the 365-day philosophy. You know, you're selling yourself and our chapter, and ultimately we're selling Sigma Alpha Epsilon. You know, it's really important for us to, like as we talked about, um, you know, relationship focus, not event focus. People join Sigma Alpha Epsilon um, for those bonds that they're creating. And some people join because of the events. 
we've got to sometimes think about that when we're recruiting people. Are those really the brothers that we want, or are we, are we finding the people that really are about building those relationships with another brother and actually being there to make SAE bigger, better, and stronger? And that's something that we've got to continue to, to, to think about in the back of our minds as making our product bigger, stronger, and, and here for, forever. Um, we want to also keep in mind to recruit students who are better than we are. Obviously, all of us that are on the call here and brothers that, we, that are in our organizations, we're already SAE brothers. We've got to go out there and find our replacements in this organization. We've got to go out and find people that are better than us and, and accept that there are opportunities for us to, to find them in every and all portions of the campus. So go out there and find people that are better us, better at maybe intramurals, better at leadership, better at academics, whatever it is to make Sigma Alpha Epsilon stronger. We've got to go out there and find those brothers. A uh, really key component uh, of our uh, keys to remember here is every action that we as brothers do uh, represents Sigma Alpha Epsilon to the fullest, every action. Every potential person that's out there is a recruiter for our organization. So when, whether we're opening the door for a woman or in the classroom sitting in the front row or putting things up on our Facebook, we've got to remember that every and all actions that we do in our everyday living as brothers of the organization is representing us to the fullest, and we want to make sure that our, how are we wearing our product every day that we're out there? How are we representing this product of our fraternity every day we're out there? We are constantly selling this organization to potential members of our organization as well as potential recruits. You know, you get, you've heard the concept, we don't buy our friends, we buy opportunities and experiences. That's something that is really important for us to, to really look at that as an opportunity. You know, to really sell it. These are opportunities that are worthwhile and, and to make sure that our members understand uh, that when they're selling this product and to let people know that this is an opportunity that is worthwhile. Um, always getting members to, uh, who get it. You know, helping chapters think about the type of men, leaders uh, they should recruit. Having them understand, you know, that brothers that are out there selling our organization, they understand exactly what is it that SAE is from, from start to finish and that they should be our front lines about their selling and recruiting our potential members. Uh, another resource for you guys to look at that we'll share with you and share it, um, is fired up getting members that get it. It's a really awesome opportunity for you guys to really uh, see this article that's written and, and having us share that with our members um, to put a whole different mind frame as to what it is that we're actually trying to sell. And the last thing is any type of thing to remember when you're trying to go out there in, in, in business or whatnot is uh, always be uh, able to plan, uh, prepare, and execute our plan of attack. A lot of times we spend way too much emphasis on the weekend before rush week begins to really have a recruitment workshop or to really put time to really plan and execute our plan of attack for recruitment. We should always be working with our recruitment chair and our recruitment committees to really plan ahead of, uh, you know, right now in the fall semester we should already be planning for our spring recruitment class. We should already begin to think about how are we preparing for, um, for the men that we want to bring in. How are we planning to execute that? and to begin uh, thinking about that way in advance so that when it comes time for recruitment, we're not really planning at the very last second. A lot of times, last minute planning equals last minute <coughs> elections, and that's something that's really important for us to really begin to philosophically approach on how our approach should be when we're looking to actually get in the quality men that we want. Uh, a couple things to share with you, some of our 10 commandments of recruitment. Some of you guys have, may have seen this, and we kind of begin to start recapping some of the things that we've had. And again, we want to continue to ask, have you guys ask some questions on here. There's been some really good questions that you guys have been asking that Tom has been uh, filtering on there. So we want to continue to have you guys continue to ask those questions. But some of our 10 commandments of recruitment are pretty simple. You know, as we talked about this, we want you guys to really think about uh, thinking like a new recruit. What is it that they, uh, that they know? What is it that they don't know? What is it that we think they know? What is it that we, we, we don't know? And begin to start asking those questions. You know, again, assume a new recruit knows nothing about Sigma Alpha Epsilon or being in a fraternity. Um, a lot of times uh, what people know about our fraternity or what they know about other fraternities is what they've seen in the media or what they've seen, um, you know, on other uh, social media forums or in the movies. Again, assume that a new recruit knows nothing about our organization and begin to sell them on the, actually what is our organization. As Mike alluded to before, we've got to begin to sell the big picture of things. We've got to sell our Greek community first. Um, is that, that concept of belonging to a community, that concept of belonging to something bigger. Um, you can also substitute that of selling them on Sigma Alpha Epsilon. All those different components are elements that we need to also tie into our local chapter. Keep it simple. All too often we make recruitment such a, uh, a, a stressful and a, uh, um, 
a complex thing when in all honesty it's really about having conversations and asking members why are they interested in SAE, why do they want to join a fraternity, you know, why, what is it that they're interested in, you know, those types of things. Keeping things very simple. Keep in mind that, you know, keep in mind what is it actually that we're selling, what is it that we need in our organization, what is it that we're selling, and more importantly, what is it that we're needing to add to our organization. You know, uh, make friends, get to know these individuals, get to know them a little bit more, uh, understand that, you know, maybe let's not sell SAE right off the bat, but let's begin to start making some, some friends with people in our, in our community and begin to start selling the organization through our own actions and some of the relationships that we're building. You get what we recruit. If we take, take very little time and planning to execute and preparing for our recruitment strategies, we're going to get people that really aren't really joining our organization for the right reasons. We're going to get those people that, you know, throughout the course of their pledge program, we're going to probably say, well, maybe they're not really the type of guys that we want in the organization. You know, we should be really thinking about uh, that concept and getting what we're actually taking the time in, in recruiting. If we, if we want to bring only the social functions in the organizations, we're going to be an only social organization. You know, we're going to miss out on the things of leadership and, and service-oriented and values-based and true gentlemen. Those are the concepts that we also got to remember. You know, what's the competition that's out there? You know, obviously we all consider our organization to be the cream of the crop. You know, really ask ourselves the necessary questions. Are we the best of what's out there? And if not, we need to figure out how we can get ourselves uh, on top again and begin to find the guys that will help us get to that level. Uh, we need to know what that competition is. You know, sometimes it's really key asking non-members of a Greek community, you know, what they think about our organization. What is it that SAE is out in the, in the community? Ask other, you know, faculty or staff members on the community, what is the reputation of SAE? Ask those non-members, you know, how do they compare our organization to other members that are out there? So understanding, you know, what is it that is the competition that's out there? Um, recruit somebody, as we talked about, recruit somebody that's better than yourself. And last but not least, always plan ahead. As I've alluded to in, in planning and thinking about a 365-day recruitment, it's really about the preparation and planning ahead of time that really differentiates us from every other organization and allows for us to really take advantage of not only ourselves um, and our philosophies, but take advantage of all the other opportunities that may come from recruitment or rush week to begin to say, hey, you know, we've already got our recruitment class that's in place. Now we can spend time on actually maybe using the, the awesome recruits that we just brought in to bring in more potential recruits strengthen our numbers and finding, you know, better men to be better SAEs. And that's really a concept that we really want to begin to, again, hit it home with everybody. And looking at, you know, other student organizations that are out there. So looking at those elements and, and kind of begin to philosophically approach these Ten Commandments and some of the other strategies to begin to start recruiting the best of the best. So we've thrown a lot of things out there here just in the last, like, 45 minutes or so. But just another... Uh, point of reference that we wanted to, to provide. Uh, the NIC, the North American Interfraternity Conference, we think really uh, succinctly and spot on, uh, they summarize, you know, five steps to a successful recruitment. So we can break this down, uh, all, of the, all of the nuts and bolts and the uh, sort of back of house like logistics, but really it comes down to meeting a man making him a friend, introducing him to your friends, introducing him to Sigma Alpha Epsilon, and asking him to join. And that, I know that sounds very straightforward and simple, uh, but it really is, as we consistently see, uh, and I, I know that I'm not speaking for myself here on the call, uh, that the chapters just overcomplicate recruitment. And then it's no wonder that they don't want to do, do like recruitment 365 year-round because it, it's exhausting and overwhelming. So it is so important that you figure out a, a, a way to be organized and do recruitment well, but to keep it simple and fun. So uh, some, some final just points here to wrap it up so that this doesn't go on and on and on because I feel like we could probably talk recruitment for hours here. Uh, but, but with social media, uh, you all should be doing things with Facebook and Twitter year-round. And this is not just about posting recruitment events or when you have your rush for recruitment week throwing up stuff like free wings and come play Madden and then we're going to have a Smash Brothers tournament like or whatever. It's year-round having a social media presence and building your online content. So you can base it off of your website, but Facebook and Twitter. A good example would just be like, I, I think that some chapters create like, you know, Facebook groups for fall recruitment, for spring recruitment. But 
they have a Facebook fan page that's year round, and underneath there you can create like events. Same with Twitter. Don't just tweet about the recruitment events that you have. Make sure that you're tweeting about the service that you're doing, the philanthropy, uh, the brotherhood events. This is content that you want to put out there that is indirectly recruitment content. Uh, as we've already touched on, you're always wearing your letters. Uh, there really is no on-season or off-season with recruitment, uh, but that doesn't mean that you need to feel overwhelmed about sort of this responsibility to consistently and constantly be recruiting. Just understand that you're always sharing with people what Sigma Alpha Epsilon is. No alcohol. Right? So even 365 recruitment events need to be dry. Uh, and we get it, the National Fraternity gets it too, that you know that, that, that this is a social organization, uh, that you're going to socialize with men that could potentially join sometime down, that, down the road. But when you're doing recruitment events and you're interacting with potential like new members, make sure that even if it's outside of some formal rush week or recruitment week, that the focus is not alcohol. Um, Names, list, and teams. We could probably have a whole recruitment discussion webinar just about this. But as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, it, it's just crucial that going into recruitment, you're organized and you enjoy it. And that means that you've got to have a, a good recruitment chairman with a good, dependable team that can keep recruitment organized for the rest of the chapter. And namely, that's a names list. So having an Excel spreadsheet or something similar, that every week you're updating this thing, more often than weekly, every other day sometimes, you know, like when you're in, in the thick of some of your biggest recruitment events, uh, update this thing. Do not exclude potential members just because you think that they won't join. The whole point of having a names list is for you to own up to how many men do we actually know, What's their likelihood of actually joining? We don't know them very well or don't think they would join, so let's get in touch with them and try to recruit them. So I like to think of uh, a general rule of thumb with recruitment names list that you really need to have a names list of, of approximately three times as many potentials as you want to wind up with pledges. So if you want to pledge 20 men, you've got to have a good names list of 60 potentials that you've had contact with. Uh, so that is important, and it's important that you keep tracking that. Don't take guys off of your names list because you decided not to bid them this fall semester. Who knows? Maybe you could bid them next spring semester. And your recruitment chair. He doesn't necessarily need to be the best recruiter, however you define that. He just needs to really be organized. He shouldn't be the guy that's locked in a closet somewhere calling call BW3s to get buffalo wings and sign in bids, right? He, he needs to be out there. Do your homework. Be organized uh, going into recruitment. Have this team approach. Uh, and just spread the wealth a little bit. Get guys involved. I've seen some comments about, like, you know, how do we motivate members uh, to participate in recruitment? I think organizations a big part of that. Like you can't just expect that a week before your like recruitment week that you're gonna have a chapter meeting and just lay on guys, you know, hey, like you gotta be here for every night up for the next like five nights because we got recruitment stuff to go on. Like you guys you need to communicate a clear picture to your chapter of how recruitment works. And my last little point that's not really on this slide, but quite frankly, you can do fantastic three sixty five recruitment without ever having another recruitment event ever again, right? I think that sometimes we overwhelm ourselves uh, with this notion that we've got to plan all this stuff. I've seen some uh, chat comments about this to get ourselves out there on campus, but it really comes down to do brotherhood events, do philanthropy -like events, invite potentials to those things, do stuff that you already do, and have men come to that and do other small activities like going to work out, going to sporting events, uh, going, going to get coffee, grabbing dinner with small groups of, of guys. You can have great recruitment without exhausting yourselves with recruitment event after recruitment event after recruitment event. Brothers, as we kind of begin to kind of start wrapping some things up here, there's been some amazing dialogue that's been going on in the chat and a lot of great questions. 
And I think what it, what what really comes down to is obviously as we as we begin to look at recruitment, it's obviously a team it's team oriented. Um, you got to revolve rely on our brothers and ourselves that are here on the call and our alumni and, and, and fraternity service center staff and everybody to really help us, you know, work through the process of, of recruiting members. As, I, as you see on here, you know, a lot of times we want to go out there and find something better than us. We want to, you know, leave a legacy. And, and as I saw kind of part of the chat, and I think it's a really good testament to what we're doing, is, is to really think about our recruitment philosophy and recruiting as part of like almost like a college football team or whatnot. You're out there recruiting the best of the best to win a national championship. And our job as SAEs is out there to go ahead and recruit, you know, brothers that are going to make up the most dynamic chapter, the most dynamic brotherhood that we possibly could be. And as brothers that are in here and, 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 and you know, getting our other brothers in the chapter to get motivated about and, and their legacy, it's to really say, hey, I want to be that brother that recruited the, the next president of, of such and such or the guy that made a huge difference on this campus or whatever it is. You want to be that brother that's out there recruiting the best member possible to leave a legacy in your organization. And if we begin to kind of philosophically approach that, you know, and begin to really think about that, we're truly going to find a, a brother in, in our campuses and out there that are really going to exemplify everything that we want and raise the bar to, to leaving a legacy not only on our campuses but also for our, our fraternities. And it's important for us to, you know, determine how do we want to be. Do we want to be that chapter that's just like everybody else, or do we want to be known as the chapter that everybody wants to get into, but they only select the cream of the crop? And that's kind of how we begin to continue to make our mark and return SAE to being and continuing to be the, one of the best that are out there from this point forth. So again, as we kind of say it out there, turn the favor. Go out there and find somebody better than yourself. Leave a legacy. Encourage your brothers to know what legacy you left behind. And go out there and recruit an SAE. Don't just try to find somebody that can possibly be an SAE. We already know that they are SAE. So as we begin to kind of think about that, I know we've shared a lot with you guys over the last 50 minutes of the call. There's been some great questions, and we're going to start answering some of the questions here. Again, on here, here's a bunch of available resources for each of you guys to utilize. Again, you may not be able to get all of them, but a lot of this information will be found at the TGI um, .sae.net. Well, hopefully, I think James will put this presentation on there and some of our speaker notes. Um, again, a lot of our contact information, we can go ahead and, James, you can go ahead and make that available for you guys if you want to go ahead and ask, ask any of us some questions after the call here. Um, but these are a bunch of different opportunities for us that are on there. Um, so if you guys have any other questions, we're going to ask you guys to go ahead and put those in uh, the question box, and we're going to go ahead and turn that over right now to begin to start asking and answering some of these different questions. I also want to remind you guys uh, there will be a survey that will come out after this. If you go ahead and share some information um, about that on the webinar, that will allow for us to continue to enhance some of these uh, programs. I know there's been some questions about uh, things that we probably didn't get to. Hopefully we'll be able to answer those in the Q&A session. We really want to thank you guys all for participating in this call. And uh, at that point now, James, we'll turn it over to you if you could, um, just to kind of help us uh, answer some of these questions and, and keep us on track. Sure thing. First question, what are some key traits in a person that we should look for when recruiting? Hey, this is uh, Tom Healy here. I'll, I'll certainly jump in and take this question. Um, you, you know, the, the key to finding the right guys are guys that align with the values of your chapter, guys that align with the true gentleman, and, and just guys that have high-quality characteristics. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can evaluate guys, but I think one of the key things to keep in mind is evaluating past performance. You know, any guy can sit there and BS you and say, well, I'd do this, this, and this if I join, and they may be a likable guy, they may be from your hometown, they may have a lot of those, you know, things that make them a, a cool guy to hang out with, but at the end of the day, what have they done in the 18, 19, 22 years um, of their life up to the point of potentially joining that indicate what kind of a member they're going to be? So I want to know the grades they've had. I want to know the activities they've been involved with, the community service projects they've done. Um, I want to know what kind of leadership roles they've taken on in, in sports and in um, the church and activities they've been involved with. I want to know um, what kind of future ambitions they have. There's a lot of things we can measure, but the key is to be very clear as to what things you want and how you're going to measure those. I mean, we've we got to go after things other than nice guy and, you know, has this GPA and is enrolled in school here. So make, make a list with your chapter and sit there and say, okay, what are the things that our top members have? What the, the top 10% of our chapter, what common characteristics do they have? And then figure out how we can start measuring those new members. And, and 
one more point. It, it may seem counterintuitive, especially for you chapters, and I'm sure a lot of you are struggling a little bit with numbers and with recruitment. It may seem counterintuitive to say, well, we're having a tough time getting five guys or ten guys in the door, and now you're telling us to make it tougher and to raise the bar and to go after um, uh, you know, a higher quality guy. Well, I can tell you that having those standards in place is going to make you more attractive to more guys because the perception is, that because you're selective, because you're only going after high-quality guys, that you offer this great experience and you're full of high-quality men. So I, I would really challenge you to figure out what characteristics you're looking for and how you plan on measuring those. And if, if you get stuck on characteristics, think about the top 10%, 20% of your chapter, some of those top guys, what characteristics they have, what did they do prior to joining that you think prepared them to be successful. And again, just to run through that list again, you know, I'd like to look at grades, past leadership experience, um, you know, the kind of ambition they have for their future, um, you know, what, what kind of roles they've taken on in the past. Uh, you know, just, just get a good barometer of, of what you're looking for and then go out there and measure that. But that's going to make a huge difference because it's, it's going to be rare for you to get a poor quality guy that's going to just blossom into this amazing member. Uh, typically, guys aren't going to change much. We may think that we change them a lot, but realistically, they're not going to change a whole lot. Now, we can elevate their game, but you get the right guys in the door, and they're going to go off, and they're going to be better brothers. They're going to make a more positive contribution, and I'm telling you that that's also going to solve a lot of your retention issues of why we're losing guys. So um, just, just something to keep in mind, but let's raise the bar. Let's be very clear as to what we're looking for, and then let's go out there and, and start measuring that and share those standards of membership. Share those with anyone they'll listen because it shows that SAE cares about getting true gentlemen in the door and then letting them continue the success they've had up to that point for the rest of their college experience and for the rest of their life. Good job. This next question comes to the uh, chairman of the uh, recruitment committee. Briefly, from Evanston's perspective, can you explain or define the SAE brand? For me personally, I, I look at the SAE brand. Um, obviously, one of the things that I think as a, as a recruitment chairman, and I know we use it all too often, but I honestly really look at the true gentleman as kind of our brand. I mean, that's something that we use consistently, and that's something that I think we've really talked about um, as a recruitment committee is if utilizing the true gentleman to, to, to really streamline our recruitment philosophy. Um, it basically tells us what type of man we're out there trying to get. Um, but in, in, in essence, I also want to return some of our, our brand to really looking at the, the, the mission statement of our fraternity. It really tells us exactly who is it that we're out there trying to recruit. Um, and, it, you know, I always try to tell people, and even we had a conference call not too long ago with our, um, with our uh, recruitment committee, but we talked about, you know, the mission. You know, what drives us as members of this organization? You know, when we're looking at the mission, the mission should be at the root of anything and everything that we're doing, including recruitment. And if we begin to look at that, that should help, uh, help us in, in conjunction with the true gentleman to be able to take the brand of Sigma Alpha Epsilon um, and to begin to, you know, hold ourselves to, to that standard and in, 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 in not just hitting a minimal mark but really raising the bar, as Tom was just alluding to, and going out there and finding brothers that are true gentlemen already or members that are true gentlemen that represent the mission to the fullest. So as, as the chairman of the recruitment committee, those are some of the things that we, you know, begin to start thinking about. What is the most streamlined way for us to take, you know, whether it be a chapter from California or a chapter all the way in Boston or Florida or, you know, Minnesota, how do we begin to kind of really make something really streamlined and to get on a, on a, on a concept of saying this is who SA is, this is the brand that we are, are we being congruent and we have a, a, a measurable tool to understand who is it that's currently in our chapter and to measure the ones that we, can, we need to have in our chapter. So I, I would say that would be kind of our brand right there. Perfect. And uh, Tom, I think you just tried to answer this question, but if we say it out loud, it's probably good. What if the school organization like IFD restricts the chapters from recruiting the SAE way? Yeah, a absolutely. It's a great question. I think Pete was the one that asked it in the chat box. And I, I answered it briefly um, there, but I'll say it again because I think this is a very important point. Um, I, I work with chapters all over the country, and, and I, every single day I hear a chapter say to me, oh, well, we really want to recruit before um, rush week, but IFC says we can't. And I challenge them because I say, well, what, what can you and can't you do? And what we end up finding out is, well, you can do anything you want. Um, you just can't give them a bid until 7 p.m. on rush week. 
You can invite them to events. You can get to know them. You can share with them any information that you want. You know, so a lot of times we just need to find out what the actual rules and regulations are. Um, sometimes IFC may say, well, you can't do this, but it's not written into your bylaws. It's, it's something that goes against the um, rules of the Interfraternity Council on a national level. So we just you need to do a great job of doing some homework. And I, I challenge you to uh, you know, ask your Greek advisor, um, can we do this, can't we do this? Bring up specific examples because you know, one thing that we encourage with 365 is we need to be inviting potential members to events year-round. We need to be getting to know them. So find out on our campus before, quote-unquote, rush week, are we allowed to talk to a freshman male? If you are, well, then talk to them. You can't promise a membership. You can't give them a bid. You can sure, certainly get to know them, invite them to go play basketball, and you know, give them a good sense that you're interested in having them join once you're allowed to formally offer him a bid. So uh, it's not even a matter of gray areas. It's just a matter of people assuming that you can't do things that you can do. So anything that you want to do, ask the specific question to the people that actually know the answer on your campus. And if you still don't feel right about it, feel free to get an SAE staff member involved in that conversation because I'm telling you that there's a lot more things that you can do that you probably don't realize. So uh, again, I'm not saying break the rules, I'm not saying go off into gray areas, but there's a lot of things that you are allowed to do that I don't want to see you think that you can't do. So ask someone to get involved, ask the right people, and uh, you know, if you have a question, it's better to ask than assume that you can't do it. So hopefully that helps with a lot of these you know, gray areas with, um, with IFCs because um, I, I promise you, you can do most of the things that you want to do. Um, and just because chapters on campus aren't doing them, that doesn't mean you can't do it the SAE way because you're going to get a great head start and get your pick of the best guys on campus. Thank you. And next and last question, and I appreciate your patience because we've gone a little over time. Uh, at Iowa Gamma, they've got informal recruitment, which means that they usually don't spend as much time with people that they are thinking about bidding. In what ways can they make sure that they know the potential new members before they extend the bid, and how long should they wait before extending a bid? I think that's obviously a really great question. I think a lot of times when, you know, when to wait to extend the bid, that obviously comes in, you know, having those conversations and, and, and talking amongst the chapter. Um, but I think obviously one of the things that, you know, I know some people have like a, a timeline when bids can be extended. I think one of the big things is, is if you've taken the necessary time to really get to know these individuals and, 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 and talked with them, you should know if they're going to accept your bid or not. I, I believe in a, a philosophy that, you know, um, you know, some campuses have where you might be able to extend provisional bi uh, bids. Um, maybe begin to put like a verbal offering. You know, that's something that you may obviously need to kind of look at your own individual IFC recruitment rules and things like that to make sure that we're not in any type of violation. But I think if your recruitment um, rules are, are laid out and you're not understanding as to exactly what the rules entail, ask the questions and, and, and bring up real case scenarios. Say, you know, we've got an individual that we want to extend a bid to, um, you know, see if, they're, if the Greek Life Office or the IFC will allow such things to, to happen for you to, you know, um, get those taken care of. I hope that answers that question. Sounds good. Uh, and that's all the questions we have out there. An email will be going out shortly uh, that will give you the links that were in this presentation as well as the post-survey webinar. This webinar has also been recorded, so it will be posted to our YouTube channel as well as posted up to the tgi.sae.net in the uh, webinar series section. And outside of that, uh, just a reminder that our upcoming next webinar is going to be on uh, house safety. It's going to be uh, the first week in December, an email that will be going out uh, in the next couple days. And uh, outside of that, I thank you all for joining, and uh, thank the presenters. And file off, have a great evening. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. File off, everybody. Appreciate it, everybody. Um, we will hopefully, if you guys have any questions, we'll make sure that James has our contact information. So feel free to shoot any one of us that we're presenting tonight um, an email. Um, we'll give you our contact information. We'd love to further have converse, uh, conversations with you guys to help make sure that you guys feel comfortable within the recruitment process. So file for D brothers. Thank you so much.